Hello. Welcome to the online service of Shore Presbyterian Church. It's good to have you worshiping with us this Easter Sunday. Could you join me in a word of prayer for our time in the scriptures? Heavenly Father, we thank you most of all for your son. We thank you that you sent him to die on Good Friday, and we thank you that he was resurrected by your power on Easter, and that because of his resurrection, we are guaranteed newness of life. Lord, we could never thank you enough for that, uh, and we ask that you would reveal to us the truths that come along with that today as we look at the scriptures, the scripture from Revelation that reveals more of who he is, the resurrected one. So Lord, bless our time in your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So sometimes uh, contradictions can come together in a humorous way. For example, Oscar Wilde once famously said, I can resist anything except temptation. Of course, this statement ironically and paradoxically means I can resist nothing. <laughs> and therein lies the humor. Let me, let me give you a few more examples. Um, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. Or about this statement is false. If it's false, then... Anyway, how about, I'm a compulsive liar. Everything I say is a lie. Uh, how about, I'm a humble person and proud of it. If you like that one, I encourage you to look up Numbers 12, 3, which says, Now Moses was very humble, more humble than all the people who were on the face of the earth which might not sound that funny to you until you realize who wrote numbers. And, and finally, if you try, and, try to fail and succeed, which have you done? Now we can have some real fun with contradictions, but as Christians, we should have a really special place in our hearts for paradoxes and ironies like these. You see, the kingdom which God has inaugurated with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it, it has turned out to be a rather upside down or backwards kind of kingdom. Jesus is constantly upset, upsetting the status quo by making paradoxical or ironic statements like these. I'll give you some examples. Uh, Jesus said, blessed are the poor, uh, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek. Right? Those things don't seem to make sense. Uh, the first will be last, and the last will be first. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And later, the Apostle Paul, when trying to capture the paradoxical way that the gospel story of Jesus, the king of heaven, hanging on a cross in order to achieve victory, said, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. You see, my friends, what happened on Resurrection Day thousands of years ago turned the world upside down. And our scripture today only affirms that. Jesus, in his message to the church in Smyrna from Revelation 2, 8 through 11, latches on to some of these contradictions that show the upside down and paradoxical nature of his gospel. So let's dig into our text today. Again, we're in Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11. God has something to say to you today. Hear it and apply it. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, 
and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Now I want to look at these, um, at this passage, uh, particularly at three uh, paradoxes that arise out of our text today. There's actually a few others, but three main ones that I want to uh, focus in on. Three concepts that seem to contradict, but somehow don't, because Jesus has revealed a different way of looking at things by his gospel. First, the idea that we can be poor but rich. Second, that we can suffer but not be fearful. And third, that we can face death but receive life. So let's look first at this idea of being poor but rich. Now this message to the church in Smyrna is one of only two of the seven messages that does not contain a rebuke. The other one we looked at last week, the message to the church in Philadelphia. So here we only see encouragement. And in verse 9, Jesus tells the church that he knows their situation. He knows that they are undergoing tribulation. He knows that they have been slandered by the Jews. And he knows that they are poor. And he will encourage them in all these things. But immediately, he encourages them in their poverty by saying, But you are rich. Now, it would have been encouragement enough for Jesus just to acknowledge that he knows and he cares for the church as it's undergoing these hardships. But here he sets out to give the church a different perception of their own situation. You see, when Jesus says that he knows the church's poverty, he's acknowledging that they are lacking in material wealth, likely because of the persecution which they were enduring much of which was at the hands of these Jews who slandered them. These, these Jews who were not actually Jews, meaning they were not Jews who followed after God. They were just ethnically Jewish, and they were causing all sorts of problems for the Christians. You see, the Christians in Smyrna had likely lost jobs and business due to slander from these people. Maybe they were boycotted from selling their merchandise. It's not difficult to imagine that being slandered and persecuted could take a toll on someone's bottom line. Maybe they had, uh, maybe they have, um, they've been forced to to um, have property confiscated by Rome uh, because they refused to worship the emperor as God. And, and then maybe these Jews had informed on them, denying that they were a sect of Judaism. You see, the Jews had an exemption when it came to this emperor worship thing. They didn't have to participate in it. Instead, they just paid an extra tax or tribute to Rome. Now, Christians likely would have wanted that, a similar arrangement as that. But because Christianity was relatively new, they were unable to achieve it. Rome didn't want the proliferation of many, many religions. In fact, they, they only allowed certain very established ones because they really wanted the people to worship their own government and their own economic system. And to rebel against those systems was to bring down some harsh consequences, particularly financial ones. Now, I think that this situation is very similar to the one we experience today. I see many people worshiping at the altar of politics, thinking that if they can just get the right party or regime in place, then that will bring peace and stability. I see people so enamored with the economy and its fruit that Wealth and its benefits becomes their ultimate goal. Now, the poor Smyrnians were opposed to worshiping the cult of Caesar. They were willing to sacrifice their own wealth to avoid worshiping at the altar of the economy. And because of this, Jesus was proud of this little church. But Jesus, with his paradoxical kingdom, wants to turn his people's perspective upside down. He says, but you are rich. Now, there's two ways in which this is true. The first is easy to kind of wrap our minds around. Uh, we see it all over the Bible. The Christians in Smyrna were rich spiritually. 
And we might think of Jesus' words in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, Jesus was constantly trying to tell people that there is more to life than wealth. Later in Matthew, he asks this rhetorical question, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? You see, essentially, Jesus is pointing to the life to come. And he's saying that being right with God is of infinitely more value than having worldly wealth. In fact, he told a parable about this, about a man who found a treasure of infinite worth buried in a field, who then went and sold all that he had so that he could buy that field to obtain the treasure. Now, being in the kingdom of God as a child of the Father is that treasure. It is so much more valuable than any wealth or power you could attain in this life. For one, because Jesus has an eternal kingdom, and any kingdom you build in this world is only temporary. So Jesus encourages us to invest in the values of the kingdom rather than the values of the world. And kingdom values are, again, slightly contradictory to the values of this world. Maybe even paradoxical, right? Things like generosity, kindness, peacefulness, patience, gentleness, and humility. In these ways, the Christians in Smyrna were rich. But there's another way they were rich, even while they were poor. But to see it, you have to zoom out. You see, Jesus wants to give his people an eternal perspective. In this small, temporary moment, his people may be poor. But if you zoom out a bit, you realize that they are really rich. And not just spiritually. They are like little trust fund babies. You see, they are the children of the king. They are heirs of the kingdom. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? You see, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, which is just a fancy way of saying he owns everything that exists. It all belongs to him. He is merely letting people steward it for a while in this lifetime. Some will use it in greedy ways. And those of us who are kingdom citizens, we will spend what we are given on kingdom values. But in the new heavens and the new earth, God will redistribute wealth as he sees fit. And those of us who are heirs to his kingdom will be rich. Do we really think that in the new heavens and the new earth that anyone will go hungry? Now, those who reject God, they might experience a new level of poverty and starvation. But for those of us in his kingdom, we will want for nothing. So with a zoomed out eternal perspective, even this poor church in Smyrna is rich. Jesus doesn't just want us and these Christians in Smyrna to zoom out in regards to their poverty, but also in regards to the persecution that they're suffering, which brings us to the second contradiction. The church is suffering, but not fearful. Look at verse 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Now this encouragement from Jesus is a rather difficult one. It's like when the doctor tells you to re relax right before they stick a needle in you. Sure, yeah, it's going to be easier and less painful if you are relaxed. But the pro prospect of getting a needle stuck in you almost forces you to tense up, right? How can God's people fear not when he's promising that they are about to be thrown into prison? And by the way, 
If they're being thrown into prison, it likely meant that they were either going to be beaten or executed. You see, unlike the U.S., the Roman Empire didn't use incarceration as a punishment in and of itself. Rather, it was merely a way to confine a criminal until their trial and subsequent punishment. So in essence, Jesus is saying, don't freak out, but you're about to be beaten or killed. How could they do anything but freak out? <laughs> well, again, they need to zoom out. They need to let the paradox of the gospel adjust their perspective. And the first thing they need to observe is the one who is addressing them. You see, Jesus identifies himself in verse 8 with two images from Revelation chapter 1. And the first is that he is the first and the last. Now, this is kind of a paradoxical identification in itself. But suffice it to say that being both first and last means that Jesus is in control of everything. He existed before time and matter even began. And he will exist for all eternity future. He is the king of all things, the first and the last. A short time of suffering is nothing if the one who was the first, who is the first and the last, tells you, do not fear. Now this image of the first and the last comes from really multiple places in, in the um, Isaiah, the prophet's scroll. Uh, and in those places, God is claiming this title. Here's one of them. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. That's Isaiah 44, 6. Now, interestingly, in that context of that little passage, God is telling his people not to fear because of who he is, because he is the first and the last. Being the first and the last must have been an encouraging description for Israel to hear about her God. It's also not to be missed that Jesus is claiming to be God by taking on this moniker. And as God, nothing comes to pass without his say-so. Which is why it's interesting that we see that it is the devil who will throw the Smyrnians into prison. Now it was likely that these Christians were being informed upon by the Jews in their community. So the fact that Jesus calls them a synagogue of Satan makes sense because these Jews had succumbed to doing the work of the evil one. And while God does not author evil, he does in his sovereignty allow it to take place, allowing for the free will of evil individuals. But even then, we are not to fear because he is still in control of all of it. And this means that we will not suffer any pain or even death without it being in God's will for us. And since this life is such a small section of our eternal existence, we can even trust Christ enough to not fear suffering because it is only temporary. And we have so many more blessings to look forward to. In fact, James, Jesus' brother, tells us to actually count it as joy when we face trials of various kinds. Because it produces steadfastness of faith within us. And Paul tells us that it produces endurance and character and hope. And that if we share in Christ's suffering, we also share in his comfort. And Peter tells us, that God himself will commend us when we suffer for his sake. You see, in Jesus' kingdom, at least during this life, suffering is considered a good thing. I know, it's another paradox, right? It, it's something that comes from evil, but that God uses for good purposes. Which is why our text says, so that you may be tested. You see, the suffering comes from evil, but it is used to test us, which is a good thing. Now, I admit, it's kind of backwards sounding. Much that comes with the kingdom of God doesn't make sense to us at first sight. But we are to count it as joy when we suffer. And we are to let suffering do its work 
in us. Suffering is part of being in Jesus' kingdom. It just is. It's, it's part of his kingdom. I know it seems upside down, but that's how it is. Suffering is part of being in his kingdom. But fear isn't. Now to be clear, fearlessness is not always an absence of dread, right? But rather, a refusal to succumb to intimidation, right? Just like, just like courage is not the absence of fear, but the will to move forward despite fear. When Jesus tells us not to fear in the face of suffering and death, he isn't saying that our adrenaline shouldn't kick in, right? He isn't saying that those natural kind of fight or flight responses shouldn't kind of take hold. He's saying that you need to zoom out and have a kingdom perspective. Recognize that Christ is in control and that when your fight or flight fails you, he is in control of everything. And that this suffering that you will endure is temporary, but the results of the suffering are permanent. Your character, your steadfastness, and your hope, those things cannot be taken away from you. But how do we zoom out when we're facing something so intimidating as death? Well, this brings us to our final contradiction. Facing death but receiving life. Look at the end of verse 10 and through 11. Jesus says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Jesus says, be faithful to death and I will give you the crown of life. How can this be? Right? This is a contradiction and the most important contradiction of the Bible. You see, in Jesus' kingdom, death brings life. This is the whole reason we celebrate Easter. Jesus had to die so that we might have life. And he had to rise to show that we will have life again. Now I realize that that might sound confusing. So to clarify, we have to understand that there are two lives and two deaths for each person. There is a physical life and death for each person and that there is a spiritual life and death for each person. Now, when we are born, we receive physical life. But in that moment, thanks to our ancestors, Adam and Eve, we are also born spiritually dead or even conceived in sin, spiritually dead. Ephesians 2 tells us that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. Now, for those of us who come to faith in Jesus, our spirit is resurrected. We are born again, as he told Nicodemus. We receive spiritual life, and we call this regeneration, or the first resurrection. We now have physical life and spiritual life. When we endure in faithfulness until our physical death, which we all must face, we will go to paradise for a time, where we will await our second resurrection. That is the resurrection of our physical bodies. And at that second resurrection, we obtain physical life again. But it will be much better than before. Because it won't be tainted by sin and evil. There will be no sickness. There will be no suffering. Now after the resurrection, we stand in judgment to be judged. Where we will be declared righteous for Christ's sake. And therefore, we will not have to face punishment for our sin. Or what Jesus refers to here as the second death. We do not have to face the second death. Once that happens, we will never die physically or spiritually ever. Now for those who do not come to faith in Jesus, there remains, they remain spiritually dead even while they are physically alive, but they are yet to receive the consequences of of their deadness. So when they die physically, they will be put into prison for a time until they are resurrected to stand judgment. And at the judgment, they will be declared guilty of all their sins, which amount to treason against the high king of heaven. They will then be punished 
by the second death. Now this is a bit confusing since they were already spiritually dead. But the second death is the consequences of that deadness which plagued them from conception. And the consequence for the actual sins that issued forth from that deadness. Now this idea of the second death, just like all the rewards for those who conquer, right? Not and the reward here is that Christians do not face the second death. That idea, the idea of the second death comes from the final chapters of Revelation. So let me read a few pertinent verses to you now. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over the such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. You see, he's saying that those who share in the first resurrection, that is, those who come to faith in Christ and are regenerated, their, their spirit is made alive, resurrected, they will not face the second death. It has no power over them. Skip down to verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And then if we go to the next chapter, verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now listen, I know that these are scary passages. And, and we came to church on Easter to be encouraged. But I want to remind you that our salvation doesn't mean very much if we aren't saved from something horrible. And this second death and the lake of fire are pretty horrible. Now granted, these are just images. And we don't know exactly what these things will entail. But we do know that since they are described with language like this, that it's something unpleasant. And to be avoided, if possible. But the encouragement does come. It comes in that the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And so we must ask, what does it mean to be one who conquers? It means to have faith that Jesus has conquered by his death and resurrection. It means that we believe that Christ's work alone on our behalf is what secures salvation for us and secures us and saves us from the second death. It means that we are faithful even unto death. Some of these Christians in Smyrna were, were about to be martyred for their faith. And Jesus encourages them that if they are faithful, if they continue to trust in Jesus despite even the loss of their lives, they will receive a crown of life. Now this refers to the second resurrection. For believers, our resurrection will be one where we stand, in judge, stand judged to be judged and are declared righteous and therefore continue on for eternity with our Savior. It is a resurrection to life, a life that is full of meaning and joyous and it lasts forever. James confirms this for us in his letter. He says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Now the image of the crown comes from the laurel crown that was given to athletes who competed and won the prize. And if we remain faithful, if we fight the good fight, if we run the race, our prize is eternal life. Not a life of floating around in the clouds and playing harps. A life in a resurrected body, enjoying all the great and God-given aspects of this life with none of the aspects that have been tainted by sin and evil. I'm talking about a perfect world, a utopia, where heaven and earth have been united. This is our true hope. Our hope is not in the disembodied state we will be in after our physical deaths, though even that will seem as paradise. 
Our hope is in the new and res resurrected physical life. And I know that that can seem like pie in the sky to some people. But we have proof that it is coming. Look at the other way that Jesus identifies himself in verse 8. He calls himself the one who died and came to life. What we celebrate on Easter isn't the atonement. We celebrated Jesus' work on the cross to pay for our sins on Friday. Today, we celebrate the resurrection. The fact that he was dead and is now alive. Right? We celebrate it because it is a guarantee that though we will die, one day yet shall we live. If Jesus isn't alive, then we are of all people most to be pitied. But he is alive. And he was seen in his resurrected body by over 500 people. We can know without a doubt that because he lives, we too will live again even after we die. Now with this type of perspective, we can face anything. We can even face torture and death. Because we know that in the big picture, our death is such a small part of our existence. It is something over which Jesus is sovereign. And he has guaranteed us life despite death. And since he is, written, is risen, it is as good as done. You now some of us might be facing death. Maybe the death of a loved one or an illness which may lead to our death. Maybe some of us are facing things in our lives which make, which make us wish we were dead. We would rather face death than face the things that await us at every turn. I get that. This life is hard. And it's full of suffering. Suffering is part of the Christian life. But Jesus wants you to know that the suffering is relatively short. And in the bigger scheme of things, you have life coming, so endure. Be faithful until and unto death. Remember, it is Jesus who is in control. He is the one who decides the moment of your death. So that should give you courage, not only to face your death, but also to face your life. Be faithful. Endure the suffering. Let it test you and refine you. And know that your reward is coming. I'll end with this story of Polycarp, one of the first bishops at this very church in Smyrna. He was a disciple of the Apostle John. And Polycarp stood as a beacon of steadfastness in the face of relentless opposition. You see, the year was 155 AD and the Roman Empire's hostility towards Christians had reached a fevered pitch. Amidst this storm of, of persecution, Polycarp, now an elderly bishop, remained resolute in his commitment to Christ. Word spread that the Roman authorities sought to capture him, but Polycarp, undeterred, refused to flee. With courage as his armor, Polycarp awaited his fate. Soldiers arrived at his door, expecting to find a feeble old man cowering in fear. Instead, they were met with a serene countenance emanating peace and conviction. And as they led him to the tribunal, the crowds whispered in, the, in hushed tones, marveling at the steadfastness of this aged saint. In the grand amphitheater, Polycarp stood before the proconsul, who demanded that he renounce his faith and swear allegiance to Caesar. In response, Polycarp declared, 86 years I have served Christ, and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Enraged by his defiance, the proconsul threatened him with wild beasts and fire, urging him to recant. But Polycarp remained unyielding, his eyes fixed on eternity rather than the temporal comforts of this world. Because he remained faithful, his captors tied him to a stake, and as the flames licked at his feet, Polycarp lifted his voice in a final prayer. 
O Lord God Almighty, Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have received knowledge of you, I bless you for granting me this day and hour that I might be numbered amongst the martyrs to share the cup of your Christ. Witnessing his steadfastness, even the pagans marveled at his unwavering faith. In his martyrdom, Polycarp became a symbol of courage, inspiring generations of believers to stand firm in the face of adversity. And so amidst the crackling of flames and the murmurs of the crowd, Polycarp, the aged bishop of Smyrna, surrendered his earthly life, embracing the eternal crown that awaited him in the kingdom of heaven. Friends, because your faith is in Jesus Christ and because he is risen from the grave, you have a crown of life waiting for you. It is a life without suffering. It is a life full of joy and meaning and relational peace. And Jesus has guaranteed it for you by his resurrection. So fear not, beloved of God. The crown of life awaits. Go forth and conquer by faith. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would all be conquerors, those who trust in you alone and who know that we have a crown of life awaiting us and that we need not fear the second death for it cannot hurt us because we have been made new by your spirit. Lord, I pray that this courage that is instilled with this truth, that we would, we would take that courage and we would go forth and we would live bravely, proclaiming your word and your gospel to others who need it so desperately. That we would not fear the things of this life that are daunting, but rather that we would move forward in faith and trust, even being able to face torture and death, knowing that that you are in control of all things and that you have risen and have guaranteed us a newness of life. Lord, we look forward to that day when we too are resurrected, when we stand before your judgment throne and when we are declared righteous for Christ's sake. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, and bring that day. We pray in your name.